pleasure to welcome you here to our seminar talk today uh, with Professor William Sandy Darity. Um, uh, Sandy is one of my favorite economists, and so I am very, very excited to be able to introduce him today. Uh, and that's actually saying a lot, uh, <laughs> I must say. Um, but, but before, I, I, w I want to first just tell you a few things uh, before I introduce Sandy. Um, Today. First, I want to remind you to um, that we have a couple of other talks coming up in our in our series, and that's on April 23rd, which is about, what two weeks from today. Professor William Kosky from the law school who will be speaking on the topic of from the courtroom to the classroom: seeking educational finance reform in, in California. And then on May 21st, Professor Janelle Scott from the University of California, Berkeley, will be speaking on the topic of marketized educational reforms and the politics of advocacy. So I do want to um, encourage you to come out for those, the last two talks of our spring quarter series. Um, and they will be here in this room, same time, same place. The other thing I want to say is that Professor Darity's talk, the video of his talk, will be available on the SCOPE website within a few days um, once we can get it up. So if you want to spread the word, because I know it will be a spectacular talk, and I'm looking forward to that. And um, let me get go ahead with the introduction. I'm sure many of you have seen his full bio on the SCOPE website, but it is my pleasure to welcome the Arts and Sciences Professor of Public Policy and Professor of African and African American Studies and Economics um, at Duke University, Professor William A. Darity. He has a very distinguished um, CV, and um, one of the, a couple of things that I want to point out is, first of all, he is this year's recipient of the Samuel Z. Westerfield Award from the National Educational so uh, Economics Association, part of BOPOP, but that's a very big honor. It's the highest honor that is given by the National Economics Association, so I do want to say congratulations publicly, Sandy. I'm very proud of you and, um, and, and well-deserved. His research, as you know, um, focuses on inequality by race, class and ethnicity, stratification economics, schooling and the racial achievement gap, and a number of other issues. He's written papers about myriad topics that particularly that pertain to social stratification and race in the United States as well as abroad. North-South theories of trade and development, skin shade and labor market outcomes, mm. the economics of reparations, you see the Atlantic slave trade and the Industrial Revolution. Lots of different topics. He's a man, a Renaissance scholar in many ways. Uh, Professor Darity is also a fellow, of, was a fellow at the National Humanities Center in the 19, late 80s. He's currently a fellow at the Center for the Study, uh, for the, the Center for the Advanced Studies of the Social Sciences here at Stanford. His most recent books are Economics, Economists and Expectations, Micro Foundations to Macro Applications. And he's also co-edited a volume with a colleague entitled Boundaries of Clan and Color. Transnational Comparisons of Intergroup Disparity. He's written well over a hundred articles published in various peer-reviewed journals, and today his title, the talk of his title of his talk is Desegregated Schools and Segregated Education, a topic that is actually very dear um, and central to what I'm interested in, so I look forward to it. And Sandy, I welcome you here to the stage for the Scope Seminar Series. Please join me in welcoming you. Thank you. Don't sit this way. <laughs> There's obstacles. <laughs> yeah. well, thank you very much. Uh, very glad to be here. Um, I think my talk today will be a very nice dovetail with the presentation that Amanda Lewis gave a few weeks ago. Um, I'm interested in the phenomenon of internal segregation within schools which I believe has substituted for segregation at the facility level. Now, of course, as you know, historically during slavery times, the rule of thumb was no schooling for blacks. And then under Jim Crow, schooling for blacks was separate and unequal. Horace Mann Bond once documented the magnitude of the inequality when he demonstrated that by the 1930s, in most of the states of the old Confederacy, 
per pupil resources were five times greater for students in white schools than for students in black schools. And there were times when uh, <clears throat> white school boards did not allocate any local tax revenue to black schools, although black households were uh, local taxpayers. Black parents would then pay not only the local property taxes, but they would also find a way to build a school for their children and pay the teachers. And in this period of time, of course, we had the uh, emergence of approximately 5,000 so-called Rosenwall schools in which uh, black parents would make contributions that would be uh, matched by the Rosenwald Foundation for the purposes of the provision of schools for their kids. Now today, although schools generally are desegregated, though there's evidence of resegregation taking place, the content of education remains separate and unequal. And I would argue then that the achievement gap is fundamentally a curriculum gap. Black children are disproportionately tested on material that they never have been taught. Segregated education under school desegregation operates primarily through the mechanism of racialized tracking within schools. So consider, for example, Columbia High School in Maplewood, New Jersey. In 2005, the school had over 2,000 students in the following racial ethnic composition. 58% of the students were black, 35% were white, 4% were Latino, and 3% were Asian. The school assigned students to mathematics classes ranging from levels 2 through 5, with 2 as the lowest tier and 5 as the highest tier. Close to 90% of the students in level 2 math were black, while close to 80% of the students in level 5 math were white. Now this pattern, I would argue, is a long-term outcome of a process of systematic undereducation of black students following the Brown decision via the mechanism of educational tracking. In the mid-1960s, when the District of Columbia's uh, public schools still had a racially mixed student population, compelling evidence emerged that curriculum and student classroom assignments were being structured to miseducate black children deliberately. Black children were labeled uneducable due to cultural deprivation or an alleged tendency to learn more slowly than other children because they were from broken or unwed homes, or their parents spent long hours away from that home at work. Black children were viewed as too often being so hopelessly handicapped that a great number of them are not ready to be exposed to normal tools of knowledge offered a typical first grader. So, a presumption of black cognitive inferiority was being embedded into the operations of the school system from the point when black children first began school. The contradiction with the history of the black march toward literacy and learning was transparent for one critic of the D.C. schools who said the following. If cultural deprivation and economic underprivileged conditions were the bar to literacy as maintained, Negroes would not have made the progress they did during the latter half of the 19th century. Who among them had parents who were literate? That number was few indeed. If broken or unwed homes constitutes the barrier to learning, as proclaimed today, there would have been no need or demand for education of Negroes in the South following emancipation, for broken homes or the unwed condition was the rule, not the exception. But Negroes, however they were conceived, did learn and still learn whether they have an intact home or not. So what happened in the District of Columbia in the 1960s? track system was introduced, ability grouping, where students were placed in basic, general, regular, or honors tracks. The basic track was for students identified as mentally retarded and was a wholly remedial curriculum. The general track was a technical training curriculum for students who did not intend to pursue higher education after high school. The regular and honors tracks were for the college bound, with the honors track offering the most challenging curriculum. There were negligible numbers of black students in either of the two upper tracks in the mixed schools, and their presence was disproportionately lower in the schools with majority black student bodies. Moreover, in the district school system, up-tracking, moving from lower to a higher track, was very rare, while down-tracking was commonplace. Not only were the numbers of students in the basic and general tracks rising, but so were the numbers of dropouts. 
Black students were increasingly testing poorly in the system, but it was apparent that their poor test performance was because, under the structure of the track system, they had not been taught the material that was being evaluated. Moreover, teachers of black children were being pushed to dilute the content of what they were teaching their pupils. In 1961, a teacher assigned to a junior primary group was warned not to teach her culturally deprived six-year-olds numbers or the alphabet. Instead, she was told to entertain them rather than give them the first grade course of study. Finally, one of her students stood up after a month of these empty activities and asked when they would start to do what they had come to school to do, learn. The teacher then set about giving them challenging work to which they took with enthusiasm. At the close of the school year, her class, which had been expected to repeat first grade, in fact, presumably had been engineered to repeat first grade, tested at the second grade level, and her job was in danger. By responding to her students' desires to learn, she had undermined an intended self-fulfilling prophecy. Because of the actions of a citizen's advocacy group seeking to restore quality education in the schools, and concerns expressed by members of the House Appropriations Committee, the teacher was not fired, but her students still had to repeat first grade. Another teacher at a different school was assigned a middle track of, five, of a five-section second grade. Her group tested far ahead of the first group, the gifted honors class. She was rebuked for pushing her students and told she must slow their pace of study. After all, they never should have performed ahead of the students in group one since they were in group three. There was a strong correlation between a child's family income and his or her assignment to tracks in the system. Lower income children fell into the lower tracks, higher income children rose into the higher tracks. Race, however, was more decisive than class in dictating track assignments. Middle class black children were liable to be assigned to tracks with negligible academic challenge and also were subjected to being labeled inaccurately as, in the language of the time, retarded. Consider the case of Edward Mazik, a black youngster from an affluent family with highly educated parents. In the late 1950s, he entered the D.C. public schools as a second grader, having transferred from a private school where he was reported as performing two grades above his classification. In public school, he did not qualify for the top section of second graders and was placed in the middle section. In third grade, he was placed in the slow group and soon developed or showed signs of so-called retardation, such as holding his mouth open and walking with a gait usually associated with severely mentally retarded children. By fourth grade, the young man received a report card replete with failing grades in all subjects except deportment. His parents, having the resources, had him tested privately, establishing that he was actually, again, in the language of the period, gifted. He applied to and was accepted at St. Anselm's, and, and there are no names uh, being, being disguised here to protect the innocent. There, there are no innocents in this process anyway, but uh, this is all documented in congressional hearings, and so the family's name is, is, is reported. Um, he applied to and was accepted at St. Anselm's, a prestigious boys middle and high school well known throughout the D.C. area for having high academic standards. His grades for the balance of the year were all B's. He then became an A student, and then following the exams, he was among the 28 students chosen for St. Anselm's seventh grade class, maintained his excellent performance at St. Anselm, starting Latin in seventh grade, adding French in eighth grade, along with Greek as a third language, second year algebra, biology, religion, and English. He also even played on the school basketball team, and today he's a successful physician in Houston, Texas. Now, Edward Mazik's case was not unique among the children of the district's black middle class. Mrs. Wendell Lucas of the Rock Creek Estate Neighborhood League moved her 10-year-old son to a private school after recognizing that he simply was not being taught in the public schools. Similar problems were described by Woodrow Wilson, secretary of the Citizens Committee of the district, who transferred his children to a parochial school. Still more cases emerged in the congressional hearings held on the district schools in 1965 and 1966. Those black families who could manage to pay for private education exited from the district's public schools. And I provide you with this brief case history of the District of Columbia's uh, school system because I think it's representative of a phenomenon that soon followed that when public schools were desegregated at the facility level, particularly in the South, 
They followed the pattern that had already been established in northern schools of resegregating internally via the use of racialized tracking. So what are the consequences of this process? Well, the consequences of this process are to produce, uh, produce under-identification of black students for more challenging curriculum, and particularly in the earliest years of schooling, it means severe under-identification of kids for gifted and talented curricula. Now, I, I want to say at the outset that I'm actually a believer in universalizing gifted and talented curricula rather than simply solving the problem by raising the proportion of black kids who are in gifted and talented curricula. But, but we can come back to that. That's, 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 I, I'm a detracker. Okay. So, okay. So, uh, so, so what, are the, what are the devastating consequences of under-identification of black students for gifted and talented curricula? Well, then, first, black students are disproportionately denied the benefits of such identification. They're denied the enrichment effect, the anointment effect, and the cumulative learning effect. Now, the enrichment effect is the intellectual gain from exposure to more challenging and interesting content and the development of critical thinking skills. Following Lauren Resnick's pedagogical stance, aptitude is constructed. In short, students can be taught how to be smart rather than something that is fixed and immutable. For Resnick, ability is the product of educational nurturing. An engaging and substantive curriculum from the earliest years of school enhances students' ability to master complex material later in school. Students can benefit from both an anointment and a cumulative learning effect. Now, the anointment effect is the confidence and validation that students receive by being participants in challenging courses of study. The cumulative learning effect is the increased capacity to take harder courses later in school as a result of exposure to and mastery of relevant preparatory material in the earlier years of schooling. And also the discovery that you can crack the hard egg, that you can actually master or learn stuff that appears to be difficult on the face of it. Some preliminary evidence in North Carolina indicates that students who were gifted and talented identified in elementary school are three to four times more likely to take advanced placement and honors courses in high school than those who are not. Second, under-identification of black students for gifted and talented programs reinforces deeply held beliefs about black cognitive and cultural inferiority. It gives aid and comfort and seemingly confirming evidence to those who believe that racial academic disparities can be explained by black genetic endowments or by black collective cultural dysfunctionality. The latter allegedly results in the adoption of self-defeating behavior on the part of black students, and representative of this type of argument is the Fordham Agbu charge that black students are bedeviled by a culturally based burden of acting white. And third, racialized tracking beginning with gifted and talented selection during the elementary years can produce conditions where the one or two black students taking AP or honors courses in a desegregated school may indeed be subjected to the charge by their black peers that they're trying to be white. Let me be clear about my views here. Uh, this, this, this acting white hypothesis is widely popular and it's actually made its way routinely into Barack Obama's stump speeches. And it's the idea that black students engage in academic self-sabotage because they fear that school success will lead their black peers to charge them with, being, with acting white. High, high academic achievement will be met with being labeled as a race traitor, according to this line of argument. Hence, culturally based opposition toward doing well in school is alleged to lie at the root of black students comparatively poor school performance. Now, there's a study that I undertook with Carolyn Tyson and Dominique Castellino, which uh, appears in the American Sociological Review 2005, I think, where we undertook a comparative ethnographic study of the phenomenon in North Carolina schools. And we found little evidence of this form of racialized harassment by black students toward other black students. We did find forms of harassment of good students, regardless of race, that was commonplace, particularly if the good students displayed an air of superiority toward their fellows, and the good is in quotation marks. These types of harassment in part took the form of labeling the good students as geeks, nerds, or brainiacs. 
On the few occasions where high-achieving black students were called Oreos, it was most likely to take place in schools where black students were grossly underrepresented in the most challenging classes. This might be a high school that was 40 to 60 percent black, where only one or two black students could be found taking the advanced placement or honors level classes. Resentment from black peers would be magnified if those one or two black students signaled that they felt that they were special or better than the others. In fact, in this setting, the AP or honors classes literally look like the property domain of white students. Therefore, we concluded that on the occasions where this type of harassment occurs, and it's a, it's a minority of cases, it is the school context that produce, produces the phenomenon by policies of racialized tracking. That's what creates the burden of acting white, rather than the burden arising as some sort of cultural attitude that's imported from the, communi the black community at large. Uh, there's no generally held opposition to academic achievement across the black community, or even among black youth alone. And in fact, the best evidence that we have indicates that uh, blacks actually acquire more educational credentials and more years of schooling than whites from families with comparable resources in terms of socioeconomic status. Okay. So, so it's a problem if we have uh, under representation of black students in the most advanced classes. So let me turn to, to conclude my portion of the talk, because what, what I really want you to see is, is Project Bright Idea in Action, which we'll, we'll come to. Uh, but uh, let, me, let me conclude my portion of the talk by talking about ways in which we can desegregate edu educational content. Um, during the course of conducting a Spencer Foundation-funded research initiative titled Effective Schools, Effective Students, our research team discovered the story of Southwest Elementary School in Durham, North Carolina. In 1999, David Sneed, a white male, and, and that is significant in the context of this story, became principal at Southwest Elementary. He served there through the 2003-2004 academic year when he was kicked upstairs to serve as head of all middle school programs in the Durham public school system. When he became principal at Southwest Elementary, he immediately made a key observation. Both a disproportionately and absolutely small number of black students were in the school's gifted and talented program. Sneed saw this as a pattern that achieved within school segregation, or what he described, he used this phrase, indirect segregation. Okay. In 1997-98, prior to Sneed becoming principal, 98% of the white students in the school had been gifted and talented identified, while only 7% of the black students had been. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, the white students were like Lake Wobegon, right? Yeah, everybody's above average, right? Yeah, yeah. So the school's overall student body was about 30% white and 70% black. By 1999-2000, when Sneed arrived, 18 out of 39 white students in third grade were gifted and talented identified, but only 2 out of 90 black students were so identified. In the school's fifth grade, 31 out of 33 white students were in the gifted and talented program in comparison with 12 out of the 90 black students. By 2003-2004, Sneed's final year as principal, the fifth grade class consisted of 35 out of 90 black students and 23 out of 35 white students in the gifted and talented program. And at that stage, school-wide, 60% of the GNT students were black and 40% were white, a dramatic change in the composition of the gifted po policy. Um, and, and interestingly enough, Sneed recognized that the key gatekeepers for gifted and talented access were, this, were the teachers, that their assessment triggered full consideration of each child for the program, and so he focused on working with the teachers to alter the ways in which they thought about giftedness and how they would proceed to identify kids for the gifted program. What was the impact of this, this change in the composition of the gifted program? Well... In 1999-2000, 
41% of Southwest fifth grade students did not pass the state's reading test in comparison with 12% of the white students and 23% of, uh, and, and uh, with 12% of the white students. 23% of the black students did not pass the state's mathematics test in comparison with 9% of the white students. By 2002-2003, only 10% of both the black and white students did not pass the re reading test, and less than 3% of both black and white students did not pass the mathematics test. Southwest element Elementary had virtually eliminated the racial achievement gap by eliminating the racial, the racial instruction gap. The gap was eliminated despite the fact that white students at Southwest Elementary on average come from more affluent homes and or more likely to come from two-parent families than black students. In fact, during the interval of Sneed's tenure as principal, the proportion of students at the school eligible for free and reduced lunch rose from 30 to 47 percent, increasing from 61 to 68 percent for black students, and decreasing from 33 percent to 22 percent for white students. So you close the gap with a population that is actually demonstrating more evidence of being impoverished. Okay, so that's interesting. All right. um, okay, so that's, that's the Sneed program. But I want to focus in some detail today on Project Bright Idea, a demonstration project that is being completed in North Carolina that was funded by the Javits program of the U.S. Department of Education that begins in kindergarten and tailors gifted methodologies for regular classroom teachers to use with all children. Now, this is a program of curriculum and instruction that was developed by uh, the American Association for uh, Gifted Children. And uh, what's unique about the American Association for Gifted Children is that the premise of that organization is that gifted education should be for all. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so you detract, but you detract towards excellence. Okay, so, all right. Uh, and so, uh, uh, so Project Bright Idea really is predicated on the view, well, so, so in Project Bright Idea, the students are told that, uh, they, they, they are told that there's a set of behaviors that are associated with being gifted. But they're also told that everybody can learn those behaviors. Okay. And so, uh, and, and there's some interesting other dimensions to this. Uh, in, instead of denigrating the styles of speech that children bring to the classroom from their homes and neighborhoods, in Project Bright Idea, the premise is that there's a particular way in which we speak in the classroom but you are entirely free to speak in whatever way you prefer outside of the classroom. But there is a language or a discourse or a style that we use in the classroom setting. And so the students are encouraged to speak in complete sentences. Um, and, and they're also encouraged to begin writing very, very early. Uh, and not with uh, so much receptiveness to flexible spelling. As, as frequently as, as the case. Okay. okay. Uh, so, so Project Bright Idea was located in elementary schools in North Carolina that on average have about 900 students, 60% of their students eligible for free and reduced lunch, and at least 35% of their population black or Latino. The students were chosen at random for Bright Idea classrooms. And these are classrooms where the teachers have been trained to provide the Bright Idea curriculum. Now, interestingly enough, um, one of the most crucial dimensions of the teacher training, which is fairly intense and requires approximately 22 to 25 days of training, uh, one of the most important dimensions is the trainers addressing the teacher's dispositions about the children. Okay, so teacher dispositions is a crucial, crucial dimension that has to be addressed, which is embodied in addressing their expectations about what the kids can do. So what Bright Idea does is it breaks through this notion 
that there are developmentally appropriate limits to what kids can learn. So there are various kinds of concepts and ideas that Bright Idea promotes and encourages kids to learn at a very young age. What has to be developmentally appropriate is the way in which they're taught the concepts. Okay. So it's not the concepts themselves that are out, out, out of limits or out of bounds, but it's the approach to, to encouraging them to learn these, these, these concepts. So I, I would argue that the experience at Southwest Elementary and with Project Bright Idea, which you're, you're going to see in action in a moment, suggests that a preferred initial policy to desegregate education is to universalize access to a high-level demanding curriculum for all kids. Uh, a challenging curriculum. If that's not possible, then at minimum, access to a gifted and talented quality curriculum should be equalized by race. Okay. And I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, what's the trick for turning this on? Okay. Okay, so enjoy. <laughs> Well, we show them all because they're not long. Yeah. This is what we're going to use as criteria to see who, is, who we will determine to be the great creator of our time. So look at your rubric. And we were just talking about with my class, that the first thing says rate each participant on a scale of one to three using the following criteria. A one, look at your rubric, a one means little evidence. A two means what? Some evidence. A three equals great evidence. And then look what we're going to be looking for. What's the first thing? We're going to look for evidence of what? Intelligent behavior. All right, so you're going to be listening for that. And then if you go across, can I use yours for a second? If you go across, you'll notice that you're going to judge Leonardo on the evidence of the gift, and you're going to judge Michelangelo on the evidence of the gift. where today we will attempt to determine which great creator will rule as the number one innovator of our time. Let me begin by introducing our two participants. From Vinci, we have Leonardo. <laughs> and from Caprice, we have Michelangelo. <laughs> from each person. Audience, please remember to score each person participant using your rubric. Listen for evidence of the gifted and intelligent behaviors as they speak. The debate will begin now. Leonardo, we will hear your opening. Ah, Leonardo was born on April 15, 1452. I paid the Last Supper and the Mona Lisa. I had to use creative imagination and innovation because I had to create it and I had to use question and pose and problem because I had to question it because no matter how hard it was, I just had to question it and I had to think and think about thinking because I had to think before I put the designs on and it was kind of hard but <laughs> I never gave up no matter how hard it was to me because I had to use take responsible risks whenever I went to the jail to find the guy, the person that betrayed Jesus. 
and I was born March 6, 1475, and I had to use persistence because how how hard it was, I never gave up on trying to sculpt Dave, and I had to <laughs> because I, was, I had to remain open to continuous um, art, and, art and painting, and I had to use questioning and posing problems because if I wanted to do a, the eyes, I had to do it if, and I didn't want to do it that way. I had to question and see if I wanted to do it another way than the way that I wanted to do it at first. And then um, I use I use thinking flexibly because I had to think another way because I had to lay on my back to do the 16th chapel. <laughs> I couldn't do it on other paintings because it was hard. I had to lay on the ceiling and paint it. So and that was hard for me. And I had to... Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Why are you rude to your elder? I'm not trying to be rude. I just think I'm the greatest artist. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you like to be alone? I think I can paint better, and it's quieter, so I can do it better. And because nobody can see what I'm drawing, they kind of compete with me. Marty? Leonardo, with your fascination of nature, why did you not paint any nature scenes? Because it would be too hard to get any animal from the wild and because I just thought it was better to paint pictures of humans. Why do you think you're better than Leonardo and you're younger than him? Younger <laughs> people have better talent than older people. <laughs> <laughs> why did you, you paint chip, paintings chip off the wall? Because I guess I didn't put the right stuff on to keep it on the wall. <laughs> why don't you take your time to paint your pictures? I think that's enough. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so.
So if you want to come on up. Uh, questions? <laughs> this is always like the hard part. Thank <laughs> you. Um, I'm just curious how much research there is about attempts here in California. I know, you know some of the things you recommend. I, I, my kids went through school here in Palo Alto Unified, which is a high-performing district that tries to do exactly some, at least some of the things you said, like providing a challenging curriculum for all without a separate aid program. Um, and yet I still see increasing segregation, at least self-segregation by the students in their social world, and probably segre some segregation in the, in the curriculum and in the choice of classes as they move toward high school. Um, so I'm trying to think, think locally, and I don't know what research exists for that. So um, the choice of classes is a tricky issue. And um, one of the things that we've increasingly discovered is that this notion that the students are selecting the classes on some sort of independent basis is not really, not really valid. And uh, you have to really address the question of what types of suggestions or advice they're getting from, uh, from the teachers that they have <coughs> in a particular year. Um, there's a significant amount of steering that takes place. And um, that steering is also linked to the teacher's dispositions about what the students are capable of doing. And so, um, so I think that that probably plays out in virtually any school system, including including Palo Alto. I, just, I, should, I should add, there are communities here where there is the same kind of segregation and a, an appearance of differential performance, where the the lower group is Caucasians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking places like Cupertino, yeah. where uh, there are eight Caucasian parents who pull their kids out of the school because they can't compete with the parents with the families that yeah, but the, so the, the, Well, that's class-based. Yeah, that's, that's also class-based class class to a significant class degree. Class. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, one of the companion issues with uh, the way in which tracking operates, you know, I focus heavily on the racialized dimension, but there is also, as, as, I, as I indicated, uh, a class-based dimension to Thank you. tracking operates. Yeah. That's, I think you speak to an uh, example that you knew of personally where a teacher was sort of protecting um, her own reputation as a teacher of, I think it was an AG math class. Yeah. And so it was you know, making sure that none of the black students took the test. Right. Yeah. 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 So, so, yeah, this is a school that, that one of our sons went to. And, uh, the, the, the standard pattern was that if any black students actually were in the AP statistics class, uh, they wouldn't still be in the AP statistics class by November, and uh, and so she she essentially would sort of discourage them from staying in the class. They'd get pretty low grades, and, um, so they wouldn't ultimately take the AP test. Um, so so we we had should I t t t mention the paradox? <laughs> So, so our son actually stayed in the class and got an F for the year, and then got a four on the AP exam. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In your bright idea program, um, you mentioned something about teaching teachers about kind of about teacher covering or something about uncovering teachers' dispositions about children of achievement. What did, what did that look like? If you could say a little bit more about like, what was that component of that, or did it like a no, uh, the, the, the important thing is to actually have evidence for the teachers to see of kids who are from groups that they have low expectations about actually doing remarkable things. Or, so so, so that the, the teachers can actually observe kids in action, accomplishing things academically and intellectually that the teachers didn't presume that they could. And that's that's the way in which you begin to have an entry point to to alter the teacher's beliefs about about what's possible. Yeah. 
could you say a little more about who put the bright idea piece together? Like who was behind that, or how did they come to that? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so, so you were asking me a little bit of an ego boosting question. Uh, those are fine. <laughs> and I didn't know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so uh, in the year 2000 or so, I guess, wow, more than a decade ago, uh, the state's Department of Public Instruction approached me, and I'm not sure exactly how they, they identified me as the person to do this, approached me about doing a report on, um, on uh, racial and ethnic disparities in participation in the state's public school system's most challenging classes. Uh, and this, this was an initiative that came out of the office that was responsible for gifted education. Uh, I think they had come under some pressure about these kinds of numbers of, that are associated with these huge gaps in participation. And so, uh, so I had a research team that included Carolyn Tyson, who has this remarkable new book called Integration Interrupted, which is the ethnographic parallel to Angel Harris's book, Kids Don't Want to Fail. If you take those two books together, they're, they're, they're really a terrific <laughs> combination. Uh, Carolyn Tyson and Dominique Castellino, who's a psychologist. Uh, Carolyn's a sociologist, and I was an economist. And we decided that we would examine participation by race and ethnicity in gifted and talented curricula at the elementary level, gifted and talented curricula and honors classes at the middle school level, and then AP, IB, and honors classes at the high school level. And so we prepared a report that demonstrated what we knew ahead of time, that there was gross underrepresentation of black students and um, Native American students in North Carolina in the more challenging classes. And, um, and then we proceeded to try to examine what the processes were that led to these channelings towards away, away from the more challenging classes. And certainly in the elementary years, it's definitely not a kid's choice as to whether or not they're in the gifted kid programs. And, and of course, the kids, uh, uh, the kids uh, all, all the, there were a number of cases where kids would say, you know, I have, I know I have this score on the state exam. Why am I not in the gifted program? Okay, and, you know, and, and Carolyn would say that this, you know, she, she almost, it was like heartbreaking moments for her when, when she'd have these conversations with these small children who were saying that they should be in these programs. But anyway, we prepared this report, and one dimension of the report was a recommendation that all students should have Algebra One during the middle school years. Uh, another dimension of the report was uh, a whole set of of steps that we propose that could expand or increase participation in the gifted programs. And the individual who was the head of the state's gifted program or gifted education program, a woman named uh, Valerie Hargett, was the person who then, in response to the program, uh, to our report, developed a bright idea. Uh, and so, um, and she did it in conjunction with Margaret Gale, who is the head of the American Association for Gifted Children, or the executive director. And uh, and so that's that's the genesis of it. So so they actually will say that I had a role in the development of Project Bright Idea, but uh, but they they did all the all the hard work. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. The question over here, and then I'll come to so with the idea of eliminating tracking, that would then, in a way, or it would um, desegregate classrooms. So I was wondering, on the basic level or the basic processes involved in a specific classroom, like communication between the teacher and the student, would we still see uh, differences in uh, outcomes based upon how that communication plays out? And so, like whether it be like attention that you play to certain students, I mean, you play yeah. to, mm -hmm. yeah. to certain students or things of that nature. Yeah. No, no, yeah, I mean, that's all possible, and, and, and you know, so, so the, the question becomes uh, the degree to which the teacher retraining is actually effective. And, of course, it's not going to be as effective for every single teacher. So, uh, but, uh, but, but that's, that's the core of it. 
can you really address teachers' dispositions? Can you get them to re-examine how they interact with students? Can you make sure that there's, uh, you know, there's the, the black female in the back of the room who's raising her hand that she actually gets called on? You know, how, how, how do you make sure that that's the case? So in the film, I, I think you saw that there was actually, you know, at least visually, there was a diversity of kids who were asking questions. Um, and so, uh, you know, you, you hope that that's the dynamic that continues to exist in these classrooms. But the only way to get at that is through the process of retraining teachers. And so the effectiveness of Bright Idea is, is entirely contingent on the, the training period for the teachers. Uh, so and I will say, you know, that it's a different philosophy, of course, from the Michelle Re approach, which is you get rid of the teachers. Here we're saying, no, you know, we've got to have additional education for the teachers themselves. Yeah. So, Sandy, not to reinforce a kind of a, um, very narrow understanding of what we mean by educational success, so I hate to ask this question, but I imagine there are people who want to know, have you done, have there been studies that uh, ascertain what the effects of the intervention are on particular outcomes? So by having kids to be exposed to Project Bright Ideas, do we know yeah. if there have been any shifts in... No, no, no that, that, that's, 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 that's the perfect question. Yeah. Okay, I'm not... I'm not well, engagement I'm not, to me is important, but I have yeah, to... Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Okay, so, so, uh, so we're actually in the process of examining the data. Yeah. We're going to try to compare the students who were exposed, in some sense, to the treatment, which is participating in the Bright Idea classrooms, mm -hmm. with students who haven't. Mm -hmm. And we're going to try to see if there's some carryover effect, because in most of the school systems this, that, that adopted the Bright Idea approach, it was for K through 2 classrooms. Mm -hmm. And so there's some school systems who have tried to implement it at higher grades, but not all. So is there a sustained effect from having been in these classrooms? So we're all in the, we're in the process of looking at that. The only preliminary evidence that I can say is uh, of some, some utility in terms of addressing that question is that there's strong evidence that the proportion of kids who have gotten identified for gifted and talented programs out of the Bright Idea classrooms is significantly higher than the proportion of kids who were not in Bright Idea classrooms in the same schools. Now, there's an ethical issue, since we're pretty much convinced that Bright Idea works or is beneficial. There's an ethical issue of why we don't have all the kids in Bright Idea classrooms. And the reason is the constraint has been on the capacity to, to train a sufficient number of teachers. And so there are a number of schools where you have both Bright Idea and non-Bright Idea classrooms, and you assign the kids to the Bright Idea classrooms at random, because mm -hmm. uh, that seems to be the only fair way to do it. But it also is useful from the standpoint of those of us who want to examine it. So we're, we're in the process of trying to look at what test score outcomes are, or what schools, school academic achievement outcomes are over time. I haven't done that. I'm going to come here. This gentleman had his hand up over here, and then I'll come to this side. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Just about desegregated, uh, I'm sorry, uh, detracking is an issue that's been around. You mentioned yeah, it's, it's an old issue. issue. Yeah. And people like Jeannie Oates will talk about it. The issue is not that we don't have models for, we don't have a dearth of uh, sort of technical uh, models that we can use to do, uh, uh, to do, uh, de I'm sorry, uh, detracking. It's that the big issue is political will. Because there's a lot of programs that come up and you develop them, sure. and unfortunately, academics don't really make decisions about educational policy, nor do teachers. They're made by school boards, they're made by enfranchised parents, they're made by the extent to which marginalized parents are brought into the, to, to, to the mix about discussions. So the question here is, with this program, it could be very successful, and you're working on this. How do you grow it to the point where it's going to be accepted, the point it becomes policy, the point that it makes a difference, considering that as you bring more people in, uh, people are going to fall back on these deficit models. There's going to be a lot of resistance to it because it's so non-normative. How, how do you think about that in terms of your research growing? So uh, I absolutely agree with you that the ultimate issue is one of, uh, of political will. 
Uh, I think that the history of the AVID program is uh, a case in point that demonstrates that. Uh, there's the, the, the famous Hubbard and Meehan paper about the AVID program in, what do they call it, Oakwood? It's Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Okay. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and, and there was evidence of the effectiveness of the program and then resistance to expanding it or increasing it. And uh, for, the, for, the, for reasons that parents are, in some sense, trying to preserve turf for their own kids, those parents who have the resources to do so. So, so there's a political struggle that will be involved here, uh, but I think that the best that we can do from the academic side is to provide more and more evidence that there are detract environments that are efficacious for all students, uh, and and so in some sense we're in some sense we're providing ammunition for engaging in this kind of struggle to try to make an alteration, uh, given the fact that there is there clearly is significant opposition to trying to do this. But yeah, you're 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 very much correct. Okay, so they come to the gentleman in the back, then we'll go this way. Um, I, uh, I would like to find out like uh, what's the motivation behind uh, giving advantage of people of specific look. You know, why don't you just any students who are bright, irrespective of who they look, and then let's work with those kids instead of working with kids, you know, like, so why do you want to have black kids? Just to say, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Uh, so, the whole objective of this study is to help black kids, that's how I see that. So why don't you pick kids who are brilliant, because they have brilliant genes or brilliant and then let's work with those kids, irrespective of the fact if they are black. So, so, so there, 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 are two, there are two issues here. One is that the, the focus of my discussion on, on black students arises because of, of the evidence that the brilliant black kids are getting excluded from the high level of instruction, that there are mechanisms that weed them out of these more challenging classes. So that's, that's one issue. But the second is, I, I, I probably don't share your view that there's this fixity in terms of who we can identify as being brilliant. And in fact, I would argue that this process of excluding large numbers of kids from the more challenging curriculum is a way in which we make sure that they're not brilliant. But uh, I mean, I would counter argue with you in a sense that most of the black girls who um, bear babies, like let's say to impaler or the maternity hospital, they make choices about men who should have their father or who let them father their kids based upon if they have gene of like let's say they believe some men are better than others, right? Yeah, but I, I don't know what this has to do with intellectual capability from of the, the children. Say, so, you may have a view that intelligence is is, is hugely biologically driven, and and I'm okay, saying sure. I'm saying something different. I'm I'm saying that uh, human intelligence or smartness is something that frequently is crafted and constructed, not only by the home environment, but frequently by the academic environment the kids are. So we may, we may not have rapprochement here because I'm starting from a very different view of the nature of intelligence from the way in which I think you you might be thinking of it. Now want to come over here to the gentleman right here? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm founder and CEO of Ten Books of Home, and it's an early childhood literacy organization and family engagement organization here in East Palo Alto. And um, I've also lived in East Palo Alto for over three years. And, uh, well, I really like this program, but... When I think about this program, I think about it in relation to a district like Ravenswood, where um, they're, they're very limited in their access to resources and have a very high turnover of teachers. And so uh, this program is, is pitted in uh, teacher retraining. Um, I wonder how a district like Ravenswood would respond, uh, being that there are so many teachers that are turning over, but you have to make an investment in your teachers. And so you seem to have somewhat of a uh, the program and, and what would occur in a district like that, kind of two, two kind of opposing forces pulling at each other. 
So, so the problem is you, 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 you might have the teachers go through the retraining program and then they would no longer necessarily be at your schools. Or the administration would uh, look upon an investment in the program as uh, a disinvestment or deinvestment because of the fact that they are having such a high turnover. So may not reject the program on merit, so this gets to this, this grander policy question of the responsibility of schools of education in preparing teachers. So ideally, uh, all teachers would have the opportunity for some form of training that would be very similar to what we have in mind with Bright Idea. In fact, I'm not personally wedded to Bright Idea per se, because as I, I gave the ex example of Southwest Elementary, where what the principal did was not introduce the Bright Idea curriculum, but simply increase the, the significantly increase the number of students who had the opportunity to have the gifted and talented instruction. So, uh, so, so, so maybe that's the more critical dimension: is 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 finding ways to upgrade the quality of the instruction that the kids get. Uh, you don't necessarily have to do it by bringing Bright Idea instruction into the classroom, mm -hmm. but uh, but the teacher dispositions or expectations are something that's critical to address. And so, you know, maybe this gets to the question of the responsibilities of schools of education in terms of how they're preparing teachers. And, you know, maybe schools of education can shift their preparation of teachers so that all teachers are, are being trained or prepared to deliver a high-level curriculum to all of their students. That's where I was thinking, too, yeah. more toward the institution. It, it's also a policy choice. As a former district administrator, if you don't invest in your people, you're not going to get high return over the long run. Uh, so, the, so the choice, if you look at what happens when teachers feel good about the classrooms they're working in, they stay. Now, when they don't feel good about it, they go someplace where they know they can do. So this is a policy decision that administrators have to make. And you know, and I think about all the folks that are in this room, how we leave this room and talk about possibilities. You know, because I, I think of two programs. This is these aren't the only programs. Right. You know, I think about TESA, which is teacher expectation, student achievement. I think about the National Over and Alliance. There are a number of things where teacher dispositions are at the core of how you really help deliver quality instruction for all children. So that's in many ways a shift in how we talk about our work in the places we work, but also how we talk about it in public and to policy. So I'm sorry to butt in, but I'm like, this is what I used to do all the time. Yeah, no. <laughs> and I'm just sort of thinking it's critical. I love, I love discussions like this. Yeah. One thing I might ask, I'm sorry to take the mic, no, no, so no, one thing I might ask also is, um, uh, and I, I'm going to point right at Ravenswood because I have a lot of experience in the air. Um, there is a very, very strong focus on tests. Mm -hmm. And so when you take any sort of program that may jeopardize or may shake it up and you're not certain of whether it's going to positively affect the test, uh, you may become more reluctant. So this gets back to Prudence's question. And, and I think it's, it's, you know, it, it's critical whether or not we can demonstrate that there is... Mm -hmm strong test performance from the, from the kids. And, and if, if, if there's not, then I think we need to rethink what we're doing. Uh, but, 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 the, but the key point is that Project Bright Idea is not a, an instructional mechanism that is geared towards improve, directly improving test performance. It's, it's geared towards right. it's geared towards improving critical thinking skills in a wider sense, you know, giving kids a sense of excitement so that they'll actually learn something about Michelangelo and Leonardo as first graders. I mean, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So this is this is this uh, is uh, yeah. So 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 I I think you know we pro preliminarily we believe that there's evidence that there's a positive effect on test scores, but I. I don't want to say anything definitive until we've done done, done the research. But yeah, so that's it. Yeah. I, um, Hi. I'm a parent of a third grader now, mm -hmm. and I've come at the approach that um, I didn't know about heat tracking because I went to school to everybody's tracking. Yeah. And um, and I understand absolutely the downside of tracking, self fulfilling prophecy, blah blah blah. Um, but what we're struggling with is that my son, who in the olden days would have been tracked high and is now in the you know, heat-tracked environment, he doesn't have the excitement to be in the classroom. He 
very bored. He, I don't think he's not being challenged. And when I like, you talk to the teacher, the teacher says, "Well, I can't give different <coughs> kids different homework because then those who don't get this homework will feel bad." Or so it's like you know, we've got he's trying to read a book because he knows what to, when she has to talk to the whole classroom because everyone's not se separate out. He's reading a book. We give him a squishy ball. He doodles. He draws. Would, would he have been bored no, in that classroom? No, but I'm saying as a parent, like, what can you share? Well, see, the problem, I think that the problem, the problem, the detractors the problem is, 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 is that, that I think no, that, what you're, that what you're describing is detracting toward mediocrity. Yes, right. yeah. Yeah, that's what and, I, and, that's and, what I've and, and, and that's, that's, that's exactly yeah. what I'm not in favor of. Okay. Well, yeah. Other than advocating for Program. Yeah. So there's a brochure in the back, and it actually says that the objective of Bright Idea is to have a curriculum that's targeted at the, th the, the, the in quotes, the brightest three to five percent. But you're going to give it to all? So then the, the teacher does have to make adaptations in terms of personalizing some of the instruction. And instead, we have the curriculum that's dummy down, and the bright kids are bored, so right. having a curriculum for the top. That everyone right. Well, well, the kids who we don't necessarily think are bright are bored also. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the problem. That They're the ones who exit. They're the ones who drop out of school because they're getting a totally uninteresting experience in the school. And so, yeah, so this is this is what, yeah. So, so yeah, so detracking toward mediocrity is definitely a problem. <laughs> Uh, but detracking toward excellence, I think, is the is is the answer. And yeah. there, before you answer, there there are actually programs that help teachers learn to do that kind of teaching. Yeah. So if you'd like to talk about it after, um, I know here in in some of the centers here, um, we do look at how you really do instruction in a different way. That'd be cool. yeah. So I'd be happy to talk to you. I just want to say, in, in light in light of your comments and the gentleman here who from who's dealing with Ravenswood. Um, I used to go around telling people, and I'd like your comments on whether I was even right, that if you focus on test scores, on improving test scores, the education will probably get worse, but if you focus on learning, the scores will go up, so it ought to be a no-brainer. Yeah. Now, am I, no, I, 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 target there? I think that's right, but I mean, yeah, if you focus on learning or, or developing skills for learning, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. Motivation for learning. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. But the difficulty is the gentleman who asked the question about politics. I mean, this is a huge political issue. <laughs> if you look at how people in the general public think they know their kids are, have learned, it's because they've seen a test score. And, and I have to say, we educators have convinced them that that's actually what they're seeing. And so we've got to help them understand there are other ways to know whether children know or not. And the state right. pressures the administrators based on those same test scores. But in PI, you don't have a lot of options. Anymore. Well, but somebody makes policy. And yeah. so I really and, encourage and I, I, I kind of think that the, the bigger issue is not testing per se, right. but whether or not we're satisfied with the content of the test. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of things in the room, so I'm a little bit all over the place. But I haven't spent a, a fair amount of time in gifted education myself as a teacher. A lot of what you say resonates with me. And that's both about the under-identification, not just of African-American students, but Latino students, and I would also say poor white students. Yeah. And I think one of the issues we have to deal with is the, the perceived or real advantages of access to these courses and the, and the benefits that accrue with those for parents, yeah. but also the increased social status that comes along with having your kid get, you know, identified as gifted. And I think those are hard things uh, to give up. And so there's really two questions in this. How do we expand the, the target audience such that the conversation is moved away from individual gain and maybe uh, one that takes into account collective harm? Because we could argue that the consequences of not meeting the educational needs of all of our students uh, is, is collectively harmful to us as a society, mm -hmm. not just individual students. And then the other question is, Rather than thinking about retraining teachers and, and retooling bad habits, how do we complicate teachers thinking about the process of education itself? 